It's great to see everybody today, uh, whether you are, have been worshiping with us for a very long time, if you're visiting with us for the first time, or you're joining us online, we just want to welcome you here today. Lots uh, to just share with you uh, coming up in the life of the church. want to share with you that <clears throat> we are having a flu clinic going on today, um, and so if you would like to get your flu shot for the season, that's going to be available out in the social hall, the place where the basketball uh, nets are. Um, right after worship, and so you can just go right over and uh, fill out. There's a brief form to fill out, and you can go ahead and get your flu shot today. We've had a number of requests uh, to have some more outdoor services, and so we have officially scheduled one for Sunday, October the 10th. Now, you might uh, remember that that's the night after we have our uh, cookout and campout, and so you can come join us uh, uh, Saturday night for just the cookout part if you want to, to have some music around the fire and some wonderful food. And then we're also making provisions if you want to come in and, sp and stay the night. But this service is going to be outside, weather permitting, on Sunday, October the 10th. Now, I um, wanted to share with you that uh, I, I, I was contacted this past week by uh, the Fuller Center for Housing. They're, that's the organization that we went through when we helped down in Houston after Hurricane Harvey. And they are just desperate for people to come and do some cleanup after Hurricane Ida. And so I am in the beginning of stages of putting together a, a work trip. Um, it would be a week long. We would leave, it's about nine hours, a little bit more than nine hours to get from here to Hammond, Louisiana, where we would be housed. So we would leave on a Sunday. We would be working down, uh, doing cleanup uh, Monday through Friday, and then we would be driving back on Saturday. We do not have the specific week. We're going to be pinning that down, hopefully, this coming week. But if you're interested at all in going sometime in uh, early to mid-fall uh, down to, to help uh, folks affected by Hurricane Ida, please contact the church office, or if you have my personal cell phone number, you can contact me as well. Uh, with that said, uh, you know, we have been also collecting for cleanup buckets to help with Hurricane Ida as well. Uh, each bucket is about $75 a piece plus $3 to get it shipped to where we need them. Uh, they have very specific items in there, and so we're hoping that whatever's collected, we would buy those supplies collectively, and we will be filling up the, or putting those buckets together uh, to go into those disaster areas on Saturday night, the 9th, when we're having our camp out or cookout and camp out. So lots of ways that you can get involved uh, in, in, in the life of the church. Uh, just, you know, pray about whether that might be something of interest uh, to go down to Louisiana and have some hands-on experience uh, with folks who have been affected by that hurricane. And I guarantee you, uh, it, whether uh, you're retired or you want to just take it as a week off, uh, it will be a week that you will never, ever, ever forget. As we worship together today, may God just open your hearts and minds and souls to God's uh, word, uh, to God's wisdom. And as we worship together, may God prepare you for whatever life might bring your way in the coming week. Let's worship together. Last night I lay a sleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, methought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang. Methought the voice of angels from heaven in answer Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and say, Uh 
And then methought my dream was changed, the streets no longer rang. Hushed were the glad hosannas, the little children sang. The sun grew dark with mystery, the moon was cold and chill. As a shadow of a cross arose up upon a lonely hill, as a shadow of a cross arose up upon a lonely hill, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And once again the scene was changed, new earth this seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside the tideless sea. The light of God was on the streets, the gates were open wide, and all who would might enter and no one was denied. No need of moon or stars by night or sun to shine by day. It was a new Jerusalem that would not pass away. It was a new Jerusalem that would not pass away. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, sing for the night is o'er. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna forevermore. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna invite us to uh, just take a moment and be in a time of prayer together. Most gracious God, we just come into your presence today seeking guidance. We know so many in our world are facing times of uncertainty and confusion. We know that you are a God that makes all things new, that brings hope out of hopelessness. And tomorrows, even when we feel that we are in the midst of despair. And so guide us, Lord. Guide us forth. Let us not be stuck. We know that you have taken upon yourself the yoke of our burdens so that we might be free. Lord, uh, we just pray continue to pray for people who um, uh, are in the midst of dealing with disasters in their life. Lord, we, we pray for, for people to come in and offer a guiding hand and most especially a reminder that they are not alone. We want to pray for the family of 
Lance Corporal Jared Schmitz, who was laid to rest this past week. Thousands upon thousands who lined the interstate and roads leading to Jefferson Barracks. And so we want to pray for his family, but for, for also all of those uh, men and women who serve our country, who, who Jared represents. We pray for continued uh, peace. We pray for uh, direction. We pray for our leaders that they might seek your will in a time where others would have us look elsewhere. God, uncertainty seems to just invade our lives all the time. But we can rely on your holy word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It guides us, it directs us, it sustains us. It causes us to hopefully ask hard questions that out of confusion we might have purpose and direction. And so, Lord, we just offer this prayer for all those who would hear and would have the ears to do so, that they might hear your voice speaking to them out of the darkness into light, that your face might shine upon them and bring them peace. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We're in the Gospel of, of Mark today, and uh, there's this piece of Scripture that is really a part of a much larger section in Mark, and it's where Jesus predicts his death. It's the second time that he does so in the Gospel of Mark, and uh, it causes uh, some misunderstanding amongst the disciples. They're afraid to ask him about what's really going on, and they end up calling with, him, with one another about who is the greatest among them. So listen to this passage. We're going to be just the verses 30 through 37 out of the Gospel of Mark. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. And he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. So they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about out on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. So sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and he said, Anyone who wants to be first must be last and the servant of all. And so he took a little child whom he placed among them. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. God's word for God's people. You know, in the very next chapter, in chapter 10, a rich man has an encounter with Jesus. And as he goes up to him, he asks him, you know, Jesus, what must I do to obtain eternal life? And so Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. And I know many of you gathered here, both in person and online, you know them too, at least many of them. Thou shalt not murder, commit adultery, don't covet what your neighbor has, so on, so on, honor your father and mother. And so the rich man says, you know, but I've done all those things. I've known about them since I was very young. Is there anything else? And so Jesus says, well, yeah, you know, why don't you go and sell everything that you have, give it to the poor and follow me. And so the, the rich man leaves sad because he knows that at least at this point in his life, he doesn't have the spiritual maturity to follow through on what Jesus just asked him to do. But what I always have loved about this passage is the rich man's willingness to go deeper than what is just obvious. And so this passage of scripture, it's, it's ripe with different ways that you can take a Sunday morning sermon. You, I could preach today on revealing why Jesus wants to continue to talk about that he will suffer and he will die. I can talk about the prediction of rising after three days in the tomb. He does that multiple times throughout this uh, section of larger section of scripture. Or the disciples' embarrassment about being caught in this power struggle about who is the greatest among them. Or maybe I could preach on why Jesus used a child as an example of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This model for discipleship. But as I sat with this passage and I thought to myself, you know, most of the people that I'm going to be preaching to have heard sermons on all of those kind of things probably multiple times in their life. I want to try and do what the rich man did, and that is to go a little bit deeper with you today. Because this passage is actually just the second part of a threefold pattern that happens in this greater section of the Gospel of Mark. It starts with chapter 8, verse 22, and doesn't end until the very last verse of chapter 10. And in this larger section of Scripture, there's a pattern that emerges. In each time, three times, Jesus predicts his death and resurrection. All three times, the disciples just don't understand what's going on. And all three times, Jesus has to offer additional teaching to try to help them. 
three times, and they still really just don't get it. And the whole section is framed on both ends like bookends with blind people having their sight regained, given sight when they've lived most, if not all, of their life without it. And to understand this passage you to, is to really to, uh, come to terms with what does it mean to really regain your sight. The stark image of going from blindness to sight is set up against the disciples, the followers of Jesus, the ones who are close to him, closest to him about being blind, blind to what Jesus is trying to accomplish, blind to really what his identity is, and must con constantly be given further teaching by Jesus Christ in order for them to gain their sight and insight into what he was trying to do, into who he is and who he's trying to be. It's this whole understanding of knowing and not knowing, understanding and not understanding that are woven through these three chapters that I want to focus on today. Because throughout the whole Gospel of Mark, the disciples, for lack of a better term, are just a bunch of knuckleheads who just really don't get it. And I can understand that because I have felt that many times in my ministry. I'm just a knucklehead. So even though the disciples make up Jesus' most private inner circle, they seem to be the last ones to understand, even up against the newcomers that are coming and are in Jesus' presence while he's healing, while he's teaching. They seem to get it before his inner circle does. It's not just that they don't understand some piece of information. They miss the bigger picture. It's that they don't understand this specific teaching, which lies at the heart of of who we are as people of faith. You know, why does suffering and death have to happen? Why does God, is God even involved in that? And how in the world does that lead for us all to have eternal life? And so why don't the disciples just ask Jesus to have further explanation? Well, it's probably because they don't want to appear as confused as we all know now that they really are. Or maybe they might feel undue distress at his, because his teaching is so deep that they have a fear of how he will address it. And we do that all the time, don't we? You know, we have fear of coming off as confused or uninformed, and so what do we do? We don't ask the hard questions. We don't ask the deep questions. It happens all the time in our life, in our workplaces, in our home environments, sometimes even with our children and our spouses. It certainly happens in the church. We avoid asking the tough stuff because we don't want to be taken as someone who is confused or uninformed or not knowledgeable enough. They are the ones that are closest to Christ. The disciples are, aren't they? Aren't they supposed to know, to understand such things? I mean, put yourself in one of the disciples' shoes. Wouldn't there be um, some kind of assumption that they would already have a greater understanding of what everybody else is hearing for the first time? And then this, but this pattern persists of Jesus trying to tell them something that's foundational, that's important, them not understanding and Jesus having to give them further teaching because they're unwilling to ask the hard questions. We, just like they, we don't want to appear as if we are uninformed, and so we don't ask tough questions. We don't want to appear confused, because, and so we don't ask tough questions. We don't want others to know that we might appear clueless when it comes to te Jesus' teachings. I've been a part of the church my whole life. Certainly, I have a great grasp of what the gospel means. And yet, when we go for really answers to tough questions in our life, we don't oftentimes even really know where to go to look in the first place in the book that is supposed to give us some answers. We don't want to come off as ignorant. So we withhold the toughest questions of all. And we pretend that we don't have any hard questions We've got it all figured out. Well, let me tell you what, I've got lots of hard questions still left to ask because I'm still searching for answers. And I want Jesus 
to be a part of that. We will look everywhere else besides the place that we can find the answers to the tough questions of life. And all the time, the deepest mysteries of life, when we don't ask the tough questions, they just elude us. And what happens when they elude us? We ask, why ask hard questions? Because to withhold them only comes at our own peril. When we don't ask, we remain confused. We remain uninformed. We remain clueless. It's all just an illusion. And we do it at our own detriment, our own peril, because Jesus wants us to go deeper. He doesn't want us to live a life that is small and shallow. He wants us to live a life that goes deep, deep, and is simple. Verse 34 reveals what happens to the disciples and to us when we sidestep asking the tough questions that we're afraid to ask. They turn to arguing with each other, squabbling amongst themselves over things which are petty, issues about who is greatest, about rank and status. And we know that they're, they're afraid to ask because it says it right there in the passage. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant. And then it goes on and says, and we're afraid to ask him about it. They were willing to stay confused, uninformed, clueless. And too often we follow that same pattern. And then when we don't have a deeper understanding, what happens is we start quarreling with each other to try and see maybe there's someone among us that we'll pick out that is the greatest and they'll have the right answers and they'll be right and we will lift them up when the answers can only be found in the Christ whom we follow. When we sidestep asking hard questions, we end up posturing ourselves instead about who is right among each other. And then we remain clueless, confused, uninformed. And then at the very end of this passage, it's not the only time that he does this in this greater piece of scripture that starts with chapter 8, verse 22, and goes all the way to the end of chapter 10. It's not the only time that he does this, but he takes a child and he puts it in their midst. If you read ahead to chapter 10, he does it again. Children, why do you think he did that? You know, is it really just to show us that, hey, we should just have faith like a child that is just, you know, pure uh, and, and, and you follow it blindly without even knowing, I think it's exactly the opposite. You know, every, most all encounters that I've ever had with children is that children know that they need to learn more, that they need to be more informed. And so what do they do is, oh my goodness, don't children ask us the toughest questions? that leave us thinking, well, how am I going to answer that? And maybe, you know, there are questions that they might not be, we feel that they might not be ready to hear the full answer to. But he puts a child in their midst because children know that they don't understand, that they need to know more, that they need to go deeper, or they don't grow. And so, do you, and so uh, you, know, that, you know what they do? They ask the tough questions. And somehow between childhood and adulthood, we flip that around thinking that at some point we're just enlightened enough that we don't have to ask tough questions anymore. I think Jesus puts a child in their midst because children know that they don't understand. They need to ask deeper questions so that they can grow, that they can learn. And that's what Jesus wants the disciples to hear. And that's what Mark wants us to hear today. On Tuesday nights, for some time now, uh, there's been a women's Bible study group that's been meeting, and they've been focusing on a book, Can I Ask That? And oh my goodness, if you've paged through these chapters, each address is a pretty darn deep question that on your own, probably nobody would ever ask about faith, but they're addressing one every week. And those of you who have been a part of that, haven't those been just deep, rich discussions 
because they've almost all of them have been things that they've been would never ever have asked on their own because you don't want to appear that you have uh, less faith than you should have or you don't want to feel uninformed or clueless or confused. And so those conversations have been deep and rich and life altering. Can I ask that? You know, in the end, let me just tell you this. In the end, doubt is not toxic to faith. In the end, silence is. Jesus wants to hear our tough questions and gives you opportunities to go much, much deeper than you are right now. Doubt, asking tough questions, those will not be the things that will be toxic to your faith. Never asking the question, that's what will. And that's what Mark wants you you to hear today. Thanks be to God. Amen. A week ago, my friend Jeff Malin and I went down and worked on a habitat build. Um, What was special about this day, we were two of eight that were allowed on site. But the other part of that is that that is the first time in 18 months that they have allowed any volunteers on the work site. And so when we arrived, um, there were still cement slabs no walls up, nothing like that. And so it was amazing to be a part of a small group that was welcomed to come down there. There was the first volunteers that had been on that site for 18 months. And so that means that the homeowners really expected to have their houses being done almost a year ago. And so by the time we left, we had walls up and you could see that a, visual, a, a visible difference had been made during the time that we were there with one another. We had several other churches with us, UCC churches, Parkway was there, uh, Kirkwood United Church of Christ, um, Samuel, there were some folks from Samuel there, and we all formed this, this first group. And so if you still get envelopes, and that's how you choose to give to the church, you'll notice that there's an envelope for this week for Habitat for Humanity. And so we're still in the building of trying to provide affordable housing for the working poor. That's what this program is meant to do. Free labor to put up homes that give affordable mortgages at a low interest rate for those who could never afford a home on their own. And so we're still making a difference despite everything else because that's what God calls us to do in this place that God has placed us. Now, the Habitat's going to give us another opportunity just as a St. Paul's church to volunteer. We're going to have a Saturday of our own sometime next January or February, but there is an offering. If you don't get envelopes, you can go online and go under our giving tab, and that's one of the things that are listed under there. But know that 100% of those dollars, they don't go to the national organization. They stay right here. In January or February, if you end up joining us, you might very well meet the homeowners that are going to benefit out of the fruits of your labor for that day. So consider a gift to Habitat for Humanity. It's making a difference. Amen. About a week and a half ago, I came across a quote that I really just fell in love with, so you're going to probably be hearing it a lot here in the next couple months. Um, To me, it just speaks to me where so many of us us, as people of faith are, are, are right now. And it simply says this, is that God does not always call us for us to see eye to eye, but God always calls us to try and see heart to heart. There are so many things that feel divisive, depending upon where you fall on some of the big hot button issues right now, but God does not, always, does not necessarily call us to see eye to eye on all of that, but God does call us to see heart to heart. And that is a part of the, 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 t- the, the tough questions that we're a part of w- where God pushes us to meet on common ground, and that is around the mission of Jesus Christ.